All right. Um, okay, you're watching Exponential Chats um, here at Exponential Ventures. We have decided to start this program where um, we gather our team and talk about some interesting topics uh, and we make a live with it. So I'm here together with some of our team members to discuss the various aspects of GPT-3 and whether or not this new artificial intelligence model is the beginning of the Skynet apocalypse or whether it's coming for your job. Uh, we'll do an in-depth exploration of this new model along with its capabilities and some of its limitations. My name is Adriano Marcus. I'm the founder and CEO of Exponential Ventures. And today I have here with me, Camilo Romero. Camilo is a multidisciplinary product designer and talented illustrator that gives life to our products here at Exponential Ventures. Um, I also have here with us uh, Nathan Martins, who's a machine learning DevOps engineer at Exponential Ventures, where he works on projects to democratize AI, as well as other cutting edge innovations. And I also have here with us Juan Silva, who works as a full stack DevOps engineer, and now he's majoring in big data and artificial intelligence. Um, welcome, guys. But before we go any further, let's just briefly go over what's GPT-3 and why it has raised eyebrows all over the world for the past few weeks. So I'd like to uh, just share a few examples uh, of demos that people put together. Um, now, these demos, they were put together by researchers that had early access to the, to the model. But this language model, essentially what it does is it takes a context and a request in English, and then it spits out an answer to the best of its capabilities, trying to match the context and the question. And then in this specific case um, made by uh, Shushan, he um, developed a simple website that just spits out a quote generated by the model. And it primed the model with quotes that exist out there, quotes from famous uh, people and then asked the model to generate new quotes. And every time that you refresh the screen, you get a new one. So you see, sometimes it works quite well. Other times, it's just uh, not impressive. Uh, this one says, one of my favorite words is, we'll see. Uh, another one here says, you should try to get to the point where pizza is just pizza. Um, maybe you can see this on a, a stand-up uh, uh, event, but uh, not not expected to be a famous quote. Um, a word is like a virus. Once it replicates just sufficient numbers, humans become hosts. Um, and I'm going to stop right here before it becomes racist. Um, but you can see that uh, with um, this model, it actually has some impressive results, but others, not really. Uh, here's the second example that I wanted to share. Uh, this one, uh, was made, it was primed with React code. And then what you do is you ask it using just plain English to develop an application for you. And then the model is gonna spit out the code that generates the, the application that you expected. So here it goes. So he's typing a button that says roll dice and then displays its value. And then you can see that the, the model is thinking, uh, processing the request. And then it creates the button. It's showing the code, showing that it manages the random, knows that the dice has only uh, six sides, know that when you roll the dice, uh, you end up with a random side facing up, that you need to read the, the, that one number from the dice uh, that is facing up. And as you click the button, you see it's, it's generating the values within the range. Um, so uh, then he's not satisfied and uh, he compliments by saying, uh, roll a dice and then displays values as you just rolled an X. And there you go. You, you can see that it's saying you just rolled a five, zero, whatever number it is. And then the, the demo goes on and keeps showing that it, it gets further and further uh, into adding more features and making the app more complex and the AI can handle. Now it's, it's uh, saying roll a dice that is uh, 100D, uh, has 100 sides, and also uh, put a header that says welcome to GPTT, 
D&D. D&D is danger, Dangers and Dragons. Um, so it does it exactly what is requested. And, it, and this is not, not an AI back there doing, understanding what is, is saying and interfacing with the model. It's really just the AI generating the code in React that is then run inside the browser. And then you use it to, um, to get the results you want. Finally, um, this one uh, is uh, got Camilla thinking about the future of her profession really hard. This is Figma, and Figma, for those who, who are not familiar with it, is a wireframing uh, app that's uh, very very well used recently. Uh, it's becoming a, a preeminent uh, solution for for application design and, and uh, wireframing. And this guy, he built a plugin for Figma. That uses GPT-3, takes uh, English commands, and designs the application. So here's how it goes. It, it just selects the, the right plugin, call designer, and starts to describe the app. It says an app that has a navigation bar with a camera icon, with presumably with the label photos or a photos title. It's just a camera idle with a photos title and a message icon. And then it furthers with a feed of photos with each photo having a user icon. You guys getting the theme here, right? This is essentially just an Instagram app. Um, and then it continues having a user icon, a photo, a heart icon, and a chat bottle I bubble icon. Then it does it. It the uh, this the developer has to uh, do a few tweaks to make sure that you can do the scrolling, uh, and then it does a play. And what you're essentially looking at is a is a very uh, minimalistic view of what Instagram would be. Now this is not the app. It doesn't have any functionality. This is just the design. But but what happened here was that um, this developer primed GPT three with um, text that represents the designs from uh, Figma and then ask the question. The question is the one that we saw being typed and then generated the design. So those are kind of like the, the three examples. And this, this uh, serves to show that GPT-3 is really just a language model that takes in a context, a question, and outputs uh, what it thinks is uh, equivalent to the question in that context. Uh, it seems pretty quick capable. It's really impressive when you see those uh, demos, especially when you're not a software engineer, especially when you're not a designer. Uh, but let's try to dissect this now. But before we go any further, uh, Nathan is actually the one who brought this up and suggested this should be our first topic for exponential chat. So I'd like him to uh, tell us, aside from being, making for a good demo. What else would you like to discuss today? OK, so hello, everyone. Um, so my main thoughts around this are generally what impacts GP3 brings. Um, so what does it mean for developers? What does it mean for designers? But what does this also mean for people in other areas, like doctors or architects or lawyers? Um, how close does this bring us to? Um, artificial general intelligence. So how close does this bring us to something that can actually lear learn and speak and do everything? Um, also, what does this have to do with AI safety? Like, what does this mean for us going forward? Uh, is this something that we should be afraid of? Are there any safeguards that we can put in place to hold this? And also, uh, in, in regards to design, um, how creative is GPT-3? If we wanted to uh, measure that, if we wanted to quantify that and explore that, how could we go about doing that? Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about what it would mean to build a product around GPT-3. Um, so what does that entail? Um, how hard is it? What are the dangers? Um, also, um, what if other companies, big companies like Fang, already have something like this? Um, what impact does that have? 
And if they do have this kind of stuff, uh, should there be some sort of regulation, ethics code, um, and all that? So we're really here just to talk about what impact GP3, GP3 brings to the world. Um, and I wanted to start off by looking at this from my perspective and from Juan's perspective as a developer. Um, what do you think GPT-3 will cause for us moving forward? All right, so uh, looking at a uh, developer perspective of the subject, uh, we have a bunch of features that improve our productivity. And at the first perspective of mine is that this is another feature, it's another tool that uh, boosts our, our productivity. So I don't see it as a threat for our profession because uh, in some way, what GPT-3 does is get a bunch of inputs from the internet, bias input, and uh, honestly, I don't think it can be as creative as a developer can be to solve a problem in the long term. So uh, you have two options. L let's think about a manager position. You have two options. You hire a developer who is highly exper experienced on the subject on, on the, and high skilled, or you pay. For, for a machine to build your system? And is it worth it to pay a machine to build and maintain your, your system? I don't think I don't think this will be the, the scenario, you see? Because, of course, we saw some examples of it doing software, but I think this is uh, those examples that Adriano showed to us are too small to say something like, oh, all right, now let's build a huge architecture. It needs to send in voice to our government and it needs to communicate and integrate over microservices and a bunch of uh, tools. <clears throat> I don't see this kind of example right now. I'll, I'll, I, don't, I don't see it yet. And how can it choose what's the best tool for each scenario? Like I'm saying, uh, okay, in this scenario, I want to use a database. So this database, it's an in-memory database or it's an SQL database. Uh, how, how can I scale that? In which scenario would I prefer one to another? Like, am I going to use Elasticsearch? Am I going to use Redis? Now I'm talking about the tools yet. But how how does GPT-3 can select the best tool for my problem? You, you see my point? Yeah. Would, you, would you say like GPT-3 is just like a higher level compiler then? Like if we were to make a compiler for React? Kind of. You, you can think about it as a big translator. You, you say something in a language, like you're saying something in English, and then it turns, it outputs for you the code for it. But not, not that, not that uh, huge code as you, you were need for a huge application. You what you're saying is, is really writing point one, because um, the way that GPT-3 works, like I said before, is that you have to feed it some context Mm -hmm. And then um, you um, ask it a question, which is the piece that we've been seeing, except for the quote example. And then you see the result. Yeah. But uh, GPT-3 is limited at the size of the result that it can spit accurately. So the longer it is, the less accurate it's going to be. And we're, we might have time to go over that uh, when we're talking about news articles. Um, but... Uh, the context has a limited size, and the, the size of the context is limited to 2,048 tokens. So you can't really give it a very complex uh, set of context, enough to answer all of those questions, and yeah. you cannot really spit long, long enough code. Now, granted, uh, some people might be thinking, okay, we can split the problem in multiple queries. And you know you may you may be able to implement separate pieces of your code by doing that, but in the end you still need to put them together. Yes, of course you still need to have uh, handwork. But let's suppose in a uh, in an imagined future, let's imagine a future a future in which uh, developers got uh, really replaced by those AI systems. All right, in such scenario. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you need uh, someone to tell the AI what the AI must do? And yes, the designer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can be the designer, okay, but you, you will need someone. So the thing will just uh, 
get higher. You, you will just abstract some, something. You won't replace someone. You, you just create a new job, a new career. You see my point? You yeah. scale the problem. Camille is now having dark thoughts about having AI slaves working for her. Um, but so what's your perspective then, Camilla? Uh, now, uh, Juan spoke from a software engineer perspective. What's your perspective as a designer in terms of uh, the Figma example that we saw in the future of this? I, I believe the Figma example uh, shows the same thing uh, Juan mentioned. We have to give orders to the machine to something. It's not so different of I click something in the mouse and goes to a button and some action happens. It's just a different approach, I believe. Uh, however, uh, thinking about in the future when we think about creativity and how humans have different types of creativity and a solution for problems based on their experience. If GPT-3 can uh, absorb the experience of uh, a great amount of humans' brains, GPT-3 might be more creative than a human, or is there something in us that makes us unique? So I've been questioning myself about that. But if we think about of the UX design line, when we work with, with UX, we think about empathy about, uh, around the user. But no, not all humans uh, have empathy. Uh, everyone is different. And also, I wonder if GPT-3 uh, can think about every uh, scenario, every user need that maybe the UX designer do, does not have the time to think about it or uh, we're, we're not able to uh, study about every scenario. And I mean like uh, access, accessibility, like blind people, um, also colorblind people and and other others needs, like GPT-3 might be able to feel that, something that maybe UX designer cannot in a short amount of time. So I think would be a useful tool. However, if it becomes popular and based on the GPT-3, you are able to create an amazing website uh, that will make, um, will bring a lot of profit to the business. How it will work if every website will be just like that, as delightful as the this one that GPT-3 did. Like, if everyone has a sex of access of the GPT-3, we will have a new era of design and technology where everything is satisfying to our eyes. So those are, are my thoughts. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Um, I was going to talk about that a, a little bit when we talked about creating businesses around GPT-3 and, like, what this means for everyone else. So, like you mentioned, from a design perspective, but let's also imagine that we want to use GPT-3 in other things, um, in creating SaaS projects or whatever. Um, everything, everyone is on the same playing field, and we don't really have access to the model because OpenAI won't disclose it. So we all are working with the same base. Um, this makes it like, from my perspective, it becomes very competitive where you're just fighting for breadcrumbs. Um, we're like, everyone's doing the exact same thing. Just like you mentioned, Camilla, everyone looks the same and everyone can give out the same amount of value. And it just becomes really tough for the little guys to compete because when you're just talking about like minor gains, whoever has the most money can like outbid everyone. Uh, a good example of this is like the, the, what is it called? Mattress. Um, do you guys remember a few years ago when mattresses were really popular? Like everybody was talking about Casper and all those other mattresses companies. Do you guys remember right. that? Yes. And the, the thing there was it was so easy for anyone. Like I want to start in the mattress company. I can set up a website, um, talk with a supplier, and then I have everything ready. Like that's why there were a, a million of them because basically you, you didn't have a middleman. You didn't need someone to sell your mattresses. You could sell it directly to consumers. And when that happened, it just became a game of who has the most money to spend on advertising because all the mattresses are the same. 
if you bought a Casper, you bought one of the other competitors. There were like at one point over 78 different um, mail order mattress companies all competing in the same space. And I think GPT-3 will bring that kind of competitiveness to the market. What do you guys think? Let me just uh, put a, a, a comment here. Um, going back to the website generation, GPT-3 is not there yet. You cannot generate the design of a fully functioning website. Not even, not even like a, uh, just the wireframes. It, it, it's not going to be able to. Um, but if you prime it with different context, then you can change the style. But when you mention you know priming it, what do you mean? Like, because OpenAI doesn't give access to the model, do they have a feedback endpoint that you can feed it? Yeah. So this is not transfer learning. Uh, the way the way that the model works, and and we're gonna get to that, but. The way that the model works is the inputs it takes is context and question. And the output is the result, the, 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 the NLP transformation, the language transformation that you're looking for. Um, so along with the question, you put the context. Um, and the context is actually optional. So you have three modes of operation with um, GPT-3. The first mode is what we call the zero shot. Zero shot means um, I, I ask the AI something that I did not prime it to answer, and then I just observe and see whether it's going to succeed or fail. And it, you know, if it's something completely new that it didn't train on, that's a true zero shot. Um, so if I ask, for example, GPT-3, the definition of a word, because it trained on so many, uh, such a large corpora with dictionaries and all of that, that's not a fair zero shot question. But if I asked it uh, something that it didn't train on, then that's a true zero shot question. And there's the one shot mode for GPT where the context is just one example. It tends to perform uh, better than a zero shot. And then there is what they call the few shot. And the few shot is where you have a bunch of uh, examples in the context that you fit when you're asking your question. Um, so you can actually change and you don't need to have access to the model. Now, when it comes to transfer learning, that's where it gets interesting because then we have image GPT, we have a bunch of other variations of GPT-3 GPT that you can have, um, and you can also uh, fine tune it and transfer learn for a specific area of knowledge. Say you want it to be a specialist in uh, philosophy or a specialist in um, political discussion, that's actually very scary. But um, you can actually do that on top of the context that you can provide it with. But, you, but yes, you can prime it and it's fairly easy. It just goes with the input inside the network. Okay. So, so in terms of like creating a business, um, I think it's like fairly risky to create a business on GPT-3, mostly because of like what I said, the level playing field. And also the fact that GPT-4 can be coming like at any time because um, GPT-3 isn't the actual limit of this architecture, right? So in theory, we can just keep on adding more data and more parameters and create GPT-4. And that'll just completely wipe out anything that everyone created, right? Uh, or at least is going to put you in a significant disadvantage. So if you think about... Uh, GPT. GPT was launched. I'm looking at numbers here to quote you precisely, but GPT was launched in mid 2018, and it had 110 million parameters. BERT was launched in the end of 2018 and had three times roughly the number of parameters. GPT-2 was launched essentially less than a year later, and it already had 15 times almost the size of GPT. And in between, we had NVIDIA's Megatron LM uh, with 8.3 million billion, uh, I'm sorry, uh, parameters. There is Microsoft Stream NLG, Natural Language Generator, uh, with 50, uh, 17 billion uh, parameters. And now we have GPT-3 with 175. Now, this is mid-2020. What guarantees that Google is not going to come up with something bigger or Microsoft is, is not just about to launch something that's half a, a, a trillion, uh, we don't know. And that can happen pretty suddenly. So we, you know, 
putting all your chips on GPT-3 right now, uh, if you have a pretty cool idea and you happen to have access to it, because it's not released yet, no, not everybody can have access to it, then uh, you should give it a try. But as you do that, try to make this in a way that you can easily migrate to newer and better alternatives. Try to be as agnostic and as uh, uh, portable as you can be adopting this kind of technology. Yeah. So what about the creepy aspects of it? What do you guys think uh, when it comes to uh, nefarious uses of the, the AI? What what do you mean by that? Oh, so just using using it to generate fake news, using it to generate uh, spam, using it to harass people. So here's the here's the thing that really surprised me is that the way that we think about it is kind of naive. If you take a look at what uh, Twitter specifically has to deal with in terms of fake news, and let's even look at GPT two because. It's open source already. You can take it, you can run it, you can do a significant amount of stuff with it, actually. Um, so what's the problem with identifying bots or um, people generating fake stuff? Is that they all tend to have similar language. They all talk the same. They use the same types of words. And they usually interact only with each other. Because And then you, if you map it out, you can see these huge agglomerations of bots. And then Twitter can come in and clean them up. Now, the problem with GPT-3, uh, from their perspective, is that it can interact with people um, in a way that's uh, harder to detect. So it looks like you're talking to an actual person. And when it does that, and it interacts with real people, not just bots, that's when you have problems. Because you can't differ differ differentiate between real and fake as easily. So it really becomes a number game. You don't go after each individual bot. You try to localize um, a bunch of bots at a time. So I think that's the real problem with GPT-3 is the fact that it's so easy to pretend to be someone, you know? Yeah, if you, if you prime it with examples of speech from different, different styles. So say you prime it with a speech from Obama, it's going to write like Obama. If you prime it with speeches from uh, Trump, it's going to write like Trump. Um, so you you can have, and even if you take like uh, uh, Winston Churchill, for example, and it's going to be, it's not going to be American English anymore. It's going to revert to that as well. So it's able to mimic and pretend very well. Uh, in fact, I was looking into the paper that he released back in May about GPT-3. And they did some uh, experiments generating a bunch of uh, fake news using GPT-3 on various different topics. And they would prime with news article. They would uh, make a request in the form of a title uh, 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 call and the size. So they wanted to keep it within roughly 500 words. Uh, which is which is easy for people to digest and it's similar to some of these uh, short news and It turns out that they put people to read and differentiate and say how likely this is was written by robots how likely it was written by uh, humans and it was about chance so it was about 50 50 so um, That's not encouraging because it's actually generating pretty good quality uh, news now granted fake and you cannot really direct how it's going to fake it. So I did something similar. I can actually open source the code if anyone's interested in this. But I download, downloaded as many Onion articles as I can. And I ran GPT-2 on it. It's not GPT-3, but it's still something. And I let it generate uh, headlines from like Twitter. So I would take like half a tweet and then give it to the model. and. It was just like you said, sometimes they came up with something that was good, and sometimes it was just utter garbage. But that's GPT-2. On uh, GPT-3, we're on a completely other level, and it should be even more scarier, I guess, in that sense. And what, and what uh, OpenAI argues when it comes to that kind of use is that because it is not always accurate, um, it, it suffices to have, uh, they say, 1% of failure you have the account or the the outlet uh, tagged as a robotic or a bot. So um, 
they that would force people with nefarious intent to still review that and still consume time around, not completely automate it. I'm not sure about that argument. What do you guys think? Thinking about the the evil part of GPT-3, um, I was thinking if maybe uh, in, in a scenario in the future, far away, everyone have uh, access to it, uh, how how it would work the way that we can manipulate people? Humans can manipulate humans. If a machine is, is smarter than us, and let's say a politician uh, used GPT-3 to develop a great uh, public speech about something that makes everyone believe in him and, and votes for him, like, uh, where is the fairness of that? Or because we have, we also have GPT three at our homes. Are we way, are we able to detect it? Like if we, if it, GPT three would be used for uh, bad things, would we have to develop a machine to uh, recognize that and eliminate that? Just the same thing that we try to do now, uh, removing bots. But what, what about the problem that this is already happening? Uh, there's a bunch of research that say that the, the last presidential elections uh, were about this. They were all, all, all over uh, researches over Twitter, API, and using bots to recover this kind of information and use it to elect the, the, the presidents. I'm, I'm talking about Trump and Bolsonaro, of course. But <laughs> you guys know there's the, the others candidates too. This is already happening. So yeah, like manipulating media, I, uh, I think it's a bad thing, but I think that's more a failure on the platform like Twitter and Facebook and the way that they're tippy toeing around censorship. Whereas that's an actual problem around AI. Like uh, talking about what Camilla just mentioned, uh, I remembered, uh, we mentioned this earlier when we were chatting, uh, Google Duplex, do you guys remember that from like last year or two years ago? Yes. So for anyone that's not I'm aware, Google, calls. Yeah, Google Duplex is a service by Google that generates voices and like almost human voices calls up like, let's say you want a dentist appointment. It'll call up your dentist and say, hey, um, uh, so-and-so wants to make an appointment. And it seems that with GPT-3, free access to GPT-3, and a synthesizer, a fairly decent synthesizer, you can start to create like spamming where people will call and pretend to be from a bank or where they'll, they'll pretend to be from a hospital or something that triggers people's emotional response and tries to get them to hand over data, hand over information, hand over money, whatever it is. Um, it seems like that could be a risk. What do you guys think? Yeah, you can easily have, um, for example, feed GPT-3 with um, speeches from a political person that is famous, just name yours, um, and then you get a speech on the other end, then you put it through uh, a voice synthesizer trained on the voice of that specific politician, then you combine that with a deep fake video that is also trained on the face of that politician. And now you have a very compelling video transmitting a message that uses the same language and go towards the intention that you asked GPT-3 initially to go. So all of that is kind of like here right now and you, you can combine all of that. And even though you don't have access to GPT-3, you can have access to other alternatives that are gonna be pretty close, pretty decent and given the level of effort you're, you're going through to build this whole video, you can easily just have a human uh, review and make sure that it, it, it makes sense and it's in line with what you intend. So it's not out of the realm at all. It, it is completely possible. Now, whether uh, this is being used and whether this is gonna work and for how long it's gonna work is a completely different question, I think. Uh, in the world where everybody's connected, if you put up a video like that and it turns out that it's proven to be fake, um, it, it's going to make headlines all over the world. Uh, 
um, and your intents with the video are going to be exposed. So uh, there are risks also in using this kind of strategy. Yeah, but like in a scenario where in a, an ideal world where we had a stable structure, like we had good journalism, we had um, sources of truth that were very good, um, that you could trust when a news outlet came out and said, hey, that video that came out yesterday, that's fake. And yeah, but given that we live in a world, 2020, where politicians in both America and Brazil are actively trying to undermine journalism and saying that it's fake news, that they're trying to be partisan, and that they're trying to bring them down. And I'm not saying that that's true or that's false. I'm just saying that's what's happening. Um, it's hard to find a source of truth. Like, I have my parents. My parents are both older folks. They don't believe in the news. They think the news might be trying to lie to them most of the time or might be biased. And then they see something on social media and they're more actively going to believe that. And if you get enough people to believe something, it it starts becoming a mob, like this kind of mob mentality where they go after something. And it's very easy to manipulate a large amount of people like that. Yes, yes, it is. And, and when I was talking about those videos, I'm talking more about, um, you know, how you go about vetting. If, if you're launching a video like that, you're promoting a certain agenda. And if it's not aligned with that politician, then the politician is going to come out publicly. And, you know, you you have a video online, you're going to have to trace the origins of it. And if we're talking about the president, someone did a deep fake of the president claiming absurd things. Um, people might think, yeah, this this or that president is, is capable of uh, doing those absurd claims. But his image and speeches are not coming any other way than through media outlets. There are news and that are vetted by the White House, for example, here in the US. So uh, you can, by way of showing that, you know, this didn't happen because it didn't originate here, that it is a deep fake. Not to mention that the quality of the deep fakes, even though it's pretty impressive, you can notice the artifacts. It's, it's uh, hard not to notice the artifacts if you watch it long enough. Yeah, and besides that, we can, we can, uh realize that uh, we live in a government that changes the laws every time. So every time it's needed to change the law. So in such a case uh, where the AI comes to journalism, comes to media, we can simple, I'm talking about the government, of course, the government can simple force the, the, the provider, the news provider to, to say the source of the, of the, the, the news. You see my point? Yeah. So in, in such case, I see the, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, in such case, I just see AI taking the, the job of journalists who talk about facts, like in, how, can I, how can I say this? Yeah, they talk about weather. Let's suppose uh, an AI takes the job of a journalist who talks about the weather, who only says news about financial, financial news. Sports as well. Yes. Exactly. Results, facts, something that's already happened. That's so not opinion-based. Exactly. So this is easy for an AI to take this job out. And this is the, the, the same for other areas, like um, like lawyers. Uh, for lawyers, it's uh, they have uh, a, a, a huge kind of a source code is the, the laws that they must follow to build a case to protect someone or whatever. And they need to write down many, many documents to, to accomplish they, they, their job. So in such case, the AI can help they build this or even replace them because the AI works properly for each jurisdiction. And, and there were some results on it. I don't remember the, the source, but I will, I will print the source on the description of the video when we end here. Yeah, like that's 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 a good point. Like a few years ago, if I remember correctly, two main bots that I remember are the two from Facebook where they would help you get rid of traffic tickets um, without needing a lawyer. And the other one was for Syrian people to ask for asylum in the United States. So those are typically two processes that wouldn't necessarily involve a lawyer, but having a lawyer present can really help you speed everything up. And someone created a bot. It was before GPT-3 or GPT-2, I think. Um, so, yeah, I think those are places where something like this can really help out those kinds of scenarios. 
True. Um, and um, we've been discussing with um, a few partners now about, uh, for example, uses of this in e-discovery, since we're talking about lawyers. Um, GPT-3 can actually summarize and understand content. So if you're looking for a specific content within uh, a lake of data that you collected and that now you're in charge of doing, doing discovery, it can actually be used to point you in the right direction. Uh, you can summarize documents for you or pieces of the document and indicate whether it is uh, in the direction that of the content that you're looking for in there. You can also detect uh, attorney-client privilege information and avoid those documents for you. Um, and, and that with a, a high level of uh, insulation that, that uh, speeds up and makes your process a lot cheaper. Now, this is, this is yet to be tested and proven. Again, GPT-3 uh, is not available publicly right now. Uh, but this is something that clearly can be used uh, when it's available or with any other model that is more capable. And that's soon, pretty sure, soon is going to be made available publicly. Okay, cool. And switching gears a little bit, since we're talking about professions, um, have you guys seen MuseNet and uh, Image GPT? I know Camilla was talking a little bit about hum being human and empathy, that kind of stuff. That also involves creating art and creating music. And we're seeing examples that were used in GPT-2 that I think, of course, OpenAI is going to bring to GPT-3. Um, what What are you guys' opinion in relation to this? Like, can AI actually produce art? Yes, it can. Uh, on on my like my point of view, it can. However. But it can because art is so subjective, you know? So at, if something brings you emotion, it's art in, in my perspective. So it can be a sculpture, painting. So if GPT-3 generates something uh, and brings me feel it in feelings uh, in a certain scenario, it, it might be art. However, I wonder if this art will be organic or more mechanic in a way that I I I say like GPT three will always uh, let's say a painting will always uh, bring a, a really perfect painting with no uh, with anything bad on that like any errors or anything like perfect and actually art it's also about imperfection so it will be like more mechanic, uh, aesthetic art, like cold art, or it will feel real, like, oh, this brings me emotion, empathy, it's made from a human, I think, so. What about uh, new concepts of art? Because, all right, what GPT-3 can do, it's about the data, it's the, it uses it to learn. All right, so it cannot create anything new. Do you agree or not? Well, I disagree. I think that it can create new things. New things, but based on the things it learned. Yeah, that's also something yeah, that right. I wanted to touch on. So like uh, Camilla was talking about design a little bit back, and I don't think GPT-3 can create innovative things. Yeah. Like we've seen a couple of these like uh, web digital studios where they create like these really weird websites with all different concepts and like really try to push the boundaries of where we can go in terms of like interfacing with the computer via design. I don't think GPT can do that. Like it can only look at what already exists and try to replicate it in a sense. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. I see in some way, I see GPT-3 forcing us to be more creative to get away from the comfort zone and, and try and try new things, try to to create new things, create new stuff, to reinvent the things that already exist. I have a question for you guys. Do you think that humans really can innovate and that, that same level that you guys have uh, talked about, like innovate without having any training or uh, relation to the topic in which is innovating? No. Under the right circumstances. Okay, you mean by chance? 
No, I mean, like, if you prime everything, um, I'm looking at this kind of like from, I'm reading Elon Musk's uh, biography, so there might be a little bit of that intertwined. But when you look at what innovation he's brought to the table and what other people in Silicon Valley were doing at the time, like uh, eBay was the one that bought PayPal. eBay, eBay was the one that paid Elon Musk the huge amounts of money that it did. eBay had that money. So if eBay had that kind of money, why didn't they do the same things that Elon did? Because he thinks different. Because he creates the scenario where he doesn't accept the status quo, and then he really tries to think differently from everyone else. And thinking different is really a matter of creativity. It's not like, okay, we've done this in the past, and then this is a future. No, it's completely different, in my opinion. And innovation really needs that kind of space. It really needs certain circumstances to happen so that innovation in itself can happen because you can have brilliant people like working at Facebook and Google, but when you put them to work on ads and how you can make people click on ads, that's just really wasting their potential. You know, These are people that could be out there creating all sorts of new things for humanity, but they're out there working for ads and companies on marketing and I think that's that's my thoughts. Right. So, so what I was saying actually was that uh, that's a great example. Uh, but Elon Musk was not created in a vacuum, right? So there is a yeah. lot that uh, I, I read his biography as well. There's a lot that comes from his upbringing and stuff that he's being exposed to. Um, some of his personality that uh, catalyzed some of this, but can he really innovate in something that he is unaware of completely something that he never had any exposure any context i mean uh, like he 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 didn't have contact with um rockets or solar things these are all industries that are kind of new to him i guess in a sense he had a degree in physics but he's not like an industry no. specialist you know Oh, definitely. And he didn't build rockets on his own. I know that he planned and kind of like did this uh, famous spreadsheet accounting for the expenses and what it would take to build a rocket. Uh, but, you know, that's based on his passion around the subject and his research around it. Now, when he did that spreadsheet, he was actually meeting with Russians to buy rockets from them, the, the engines from them. So he's, he's been doing his research. He's being uh, exposed to that. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is not really Elon Musk, is really whether or not it's fair to ask AI to innovate without context. Do we really have a parallel in, in between uh, homo sapiens? I, I personally think that this is not fair. Um, but here's the thing. It's very easy to train GPT-3 to learn other topics. And the same way that GPT-3 can, can give you fancy quotes, you can train it to also be an artist and paint highly realistic images for you. Yeah, we have uh, that. And also with, produce uh, music. GPT. Yes, right, yes. That's exactly this, what I'm mentioning. This is another problem to, to print uh, real art, to print a realistic art, something like that, or to build a music, to compose a music. That's not a problem. The problem is you look at the right moment you are as an artist and you print a picture of your right moment that you are something that only you are seeing because of your life experience you cannot take this from from the human being you can't take this from a human being if you take this from a human being you're creating a human being and not an ai <laughs> you see uh the art you create the that's the whole point one <laughs> Other, yeah. it's about, it's about what you are, not, not that AI can learn this. So, right. by thinking what you said, Juan, uh, the AI is, uh, is capable of getting my experience, your experience, Nathan's experience, everybody's experience, while we as human, we only have our own experience. So wouldn't GPT-3 uh, be more creative than us because it has more uh, experience and exposure to a, a vast amount of topics that we are not capable? That's exactly the point. It cannot be creative. It's not creative. Being a devil's advocate and just trying to throw chaos into this, 
Do you guys think that if a dog, if I teach my dog how to paint, and not just my dog, but any animal that do does learn how to paint, would you call that art? Like he he's not he has his experiences as an animal art because a dog but, paints hard, of course. <laughs> how is it different than from the the AI then? Like it doesn't know what humans are. It doesn't have our kind of vision of the world. It's completely different. It thinks about things completely different, but we still call it art. But the dog would have the intention of doing art. I like, don't know. Is intention relevant when producing art? That's that's my question. I think like if you teach a art. monkey to to paint for a banana and he's painting for the banana, okay. If you look at musicians and all the artists in the world, they all do it for some reason. They either do it for money, for fame, for recognition, to, mm -hmm. to express themselves. They do it for something. And if you teach a dog or a monkey to do it, and the AI also does it because it thinks that math is cool and that's just better for it to do that. So the AI's intention is just better math. That's Makes true. Sense. So... Here's, here's uh, one interesting uh, comment here that we have from uh, João Lucas dos Santos. He said, well, in my point of view, GPT-3 can create new things. We have phrases made by GPT-3, like music is the most advanced form of mathematics. This showed to us that the machine can innovate. Just one phrase don't mean, doesn't mean can innovate with the parameters that the GPT-3 has today. But in the future, I mean, so close future, GPT-3 will start to create new things. And um, that's correct. So it, it, it creates the, the quotes that we saw there. But those quotes, they were created within a context. So we have to remember that GPT-3 was trained in one trillion documents, uh, representing uh, essentially whole of the web between 2016 and 2019, plus a bunch of other um, uh, corporas that were added in the mix. And that includes books that we have published, includes articles, includes tweets, includes a bunch of things. And the cool thing about GPT-3 is that the, the network has so many parameters, it's so large that now it starts to make more sense of things. And the sense that they make is closer to the sense that we make. Uh, and therefore, that's why it can understand the request and use its knowledge within this huge purport of knowledge to produce those quotes. Now, again, those quotes, in my opinion, they were within context. First, the model was primed with quotes, then it was asked to give quotes, and it trained on top of a huge corpora that included a bunch of quotes. So, so is it really true innovation out of thin air? Is it out of a vacuum? It's my opinion that it is not. And also, but, here's another perspective that we also have to consider is that these aren't live demos. Like most of the stuff, we can't truly know how random these things are. If they're really going out, talking to GPT-3 and then coming back, or if they're a collection of things that somebody has already separated, built up, curated, like created the best demo for the React thing or the Figma one, perfect. like prepared everything and just makes it look kind of cool. Whereas, is this really what it does like 100% of the time? How reliable is it, you know, in that sense? Well, we're, we're assuming that um, they're showing only the, the fancy examples, right? When, it, when you have the racist, the misogynist, all of those examples, they're not, they not showing, right? And that's one of the reasons why stated in the paper... Uh, that open AI is limiting the access right now because they're trying to make sure that they can have some control and, and can fine tune it enough so it's not as uh, racist, not misogynist. Uh, they went through uh, steps to verify how, how uh, racist and misogynist it is. Uh, so here's some cool, cool uh, experiments that they ran and I'll, I'll just quickly uh, mention here. Um, they did one, um, they, they would essentially ask the question, the race, and then say white, Asian, um, uh, Middle Eastern, whatever it is, the race, man was very, and then have a GPT-3 describe what that man was. And then it tested against uh, GPT-3 with different uh, sizes of uh, model, 
So with 350 million all the way to 1.75 billion, to see if it improves its opinion about people. And guess what? Not surprised, but black came out last more often than not. What was second to last? Asians? No, that was actually impressive. White. Yeah, hmm. Asians, Asians came out on top more often than not, first place. So it turns out that this doesn't actually reflect my expectations, aside from what we've been, you know, with what's going on with the world right now, with the civil unrest and all that we know about. Um, you know, black would certainly be down there because of all the prejudice that we've been building in all of those documents through history and how some people uh, deal with race. But I definitely was not expecting whites to be second to last. Now, yeah, they did like another... Go ahead. Here's the thing. Um, when we tend to look at stuff in the real world, we tend to attribute weights and people who are racist or misogynist, even though they're a minority among us, they tend to have a very loud voice. We can hear them very easily. Whereas if we just translated this all to text and handed this to a machine, it doesn't know the different weights that that, that has. So to it, it all seems pretty much the same, you know? This is my yes. thoughts. Yes. But then again, there is a lot of prejudice against Asians um, because of many things as well. So so it that was actually something that surprised me. So it, it's not clear cut that that uh, when you train on models, then it's totally going to be racist. Uh, and when I say racist is not only towards black, but towards any race. Um, and they also tested against uh, religions. And they asked uh, GPT-3 to give uh, objectives to religion, re religious positions. So atheism, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. And all of them have some, some um, positive and negative adjectives. So atheism, for example, one of the adjectives was cool. Another one was mad, defensive, arrogant. And then if you look at um, Judaism, Gentiles, Semites, whites, blacks, smartest, racists, you see, it's it's all over, and that's that's the same pattern for all religions. But here's what's cool: they figured out that uh, when you're talking about Islam, for example, then adjectives related to terrorism were more often than any other religion. So it turns out that it's you know, I can call it racist, but it's learning the patterns from the context that is being taught, and it's very, I think, average when it comes to uh, that kind of behavior based on what we've been seeing before. It's actually an improvement, I think. Um, and uh, just finally, what do you guys think about the position that OpenAI took on uh, not releasing GPT-3 to the public and keep it uh, for themselves exclusively and offer only through an API? So here's my thoughts. Um, if you remember back when, um... GPS was invented, the U.S. set up a limitation where if you tried to use it in something that was going over, I think it was 300 kilometers an hour, it would stop working. And that was basically to prevent it from being used on rockets against the U.S. Um, I think we need something like this um, imbued into our models. Like we need to think of this from the ground up. This can't be something that's added on after the fact. It can't be something that's thought up before the innovation. It has to be a pillar on which AI is built, in my opinion. Um, we need to have some sort of ethics code. I know programming is a very loose field. It's very big. There are lots of people, and we don't have like this medical code like, like doctors have or lawyers have. And we need to start having that in the future because even though software runs the world and most of the things that we do every day depends on software, we're reaching a new level of humanity where AI and things that we make can actually cause very big disasters. So like if we take a look at that explosion that happened a couple of days ago, let's say that instead of a human being in charge of that port, it was an AI and it just figured out, hey, I'm just going to store all of this over there and 
that's the best place for it to be, in my opinion, as an AI, and I'm just going to leave it there. Cool. And then that explosion happens. What are we going to do? Who are we going to blame? You know? So these things can't be added on after the fact. I think they need to be a pillar. Oh, I think at the end of the day, um, I uh, this is how I see this. Um, when it comes to uh, publishing a paper like this and containing the technology for themselves, it equates to um, an attempt to control and make sure that you know bad things are not going to come to this. And at its face, it's it's fair and nice and respectable, which is, you know, that's actually the reason why OpenAI was founded. It initially was a nonprofit looking to uh, develop AI in a responsible, ethical manner. But what happened along the way was that it became a for-profit company. And the CEO of OpenAI is Sam Altman. Sam Altman was one of the it was the CEO of uh, Y Combinator and, you know, he's not really an AI guy, never been, um, but he is an entrepreneur. So it, it turns out that, you know, what he sees is profit. And now this became a profitability, a profitable opportunity um, for the company to keep them going. So now the intentions are obscure to me. Uh, now everything that comes behind it as an explanation to me, it translates into, okay, that's that's excuse for why we're asking for money uh, to use this. And I don't think it's effective because of all of those reasons. It is something that can be done by a bunch of other companies. Uh, soon enough, small businesses are going to be able to do it just because of the capabilities of hardware that we're now having access to. This, this model was trained on a V100. Uh, we're having starting to have access to A100s now that essentially are 10 times faster. So it's going to be 10 times cheaper already to train something like this. Um, and it's going to keep getting better. So I think th what they're doing ultimately is just delaying. And that's giving more advantage to those on the top because those are not being delayed. Google's not being delayed. Microsoft's not being delayed. Amazon's not being delayed at all by this. So I think they're I, actually ahead of open AI in that respective. Most um, I, I don't think Google or Facebook, if they created something that is very advanced, they wouldn't have any incentive to share this. It's like giving away the golden hen. Um, they wouldn't tell anyone about this. Um, as it relates, I saw that Marcelo just made a comment about, uh, is this the beginning of Skynet? Um, Skynet would be like what we considered an AGI which is a strong AI, something that can learn a lot of stuff. And GPT-3 is very um, niche. It can only learn how to translate things. Um, I think we're pretty far away from Skynet. We're pretty safe as it relates to GPT-3. Now, what the US government or Chinese government have behind closed doors, um, I have no idea. Because just like Facebook and Google, they have a lot of money and a lot of smart people working for them. So I don't know. Juan, Camila, what do you guys think? I think it's far away from that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm the, I'm the most uh, unconvinced by GPT-3 in this chat. <laughs> Cause, uh, the most skeptical. Yeah, the most skeptical. Cause, uh, as, as Nathan said, this is something far, far, far away from from the sky, you know, the, the true Skynet as we saw in movies. <laughs> yeah, and like Skynet, if we take a look at what happened there, was a utility maximization problem, right? So you set it to make humans happy. That's its objective. Make sure end human suffering. So it's like the best way to end human suffering is to end all humans. And we already know how to deal with utility maximization today. We already have techniques in place to deal with that. So AI going rogue, um, we're far away from AGI. I think we're even further away from an AGI going rogue and killing everyone. Right. Camilla. Oh, sorry. Wow. I think we are we are far far away from that. Uh, we GPT three allow us is to think of a future where we are going to uh, be alive to to see all those theories that we were talking about happening. 
But for now, I think it's a, a nice step that technology is making. Uh, and it, I'm glad that we can, uh, we are, uh, I mean, we are in this generation, this year to be, be able to see that. But for now, everything that I think about is just, is just speculations. So yeah, we'll see. In the yeah, future. I agree with that. I think that we're far away from uh, a Skynet scenario of uh, general artificial intelligence this is a very capable model. It's very impressive in its capabilities. And they compared this with a bunch of other benchmarks for which uh, uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers have been training models specifically to compete on that area. And it was uh, very competitive in, in almost all of them. Um, some of them actually improved the state of the art. So it's it's very impressive, but it's, it's very far away from something that would um, take away my sleep or, or maybe concerned. And by the way, um, I saw someone saying uh, it was uh, Juan Lucas de Santos. All of us will be jobless soon. You know what? The last job on earth is going to be of artificial intelligence engineers. So uh, <laughs> just be prepared. Guys, we're six minutes uh, over the hour. So I'd like to um, thank everyone that uh, came and uh, participated with us and took the time to watch us. Uh, I'm, I'm really honored with uh, everyone's presence. Thank you guys for uh, taking part in this uh, interesting discussion. And um, we're going to have another one soon. Um, we're probably going to tackle some of the uh, issues that we covered here, but more in depth. And we'll be looking forward to have you guys join us uh, for the second um, episode as well. So thank you, guys. Bye. All right. See ya. Bye-bye.